one. The only problem with that is that I won't be able to play with the live stream. So, because you'll see my screen, you know what I mean? Let me try. Let me try this. Let's see what happens. Why don't you email it to us, both Dan, Phil, and me? Okay, I'll do that right now. Sorry, everybody. We're trying something new tonight. And so, um, you know, it's just um, messing us up a little bit. <laughs> yeah. Don't share this our email. <laughs> this is the first time that we are trying to do a live stream on Facebook at the same time. So uh, it's just. It's, it's giving us a little trouble, and so I'm trying to do that, but give us one. But so now um, everyone else has the slides and we'll be able to get started. I'm certainly glad I got all that on the recording. <laughs> so we can edit it that. before we post it. <laughs> That's okay. So everybody should have this, everyone on the committee should have the slides now, so we can go ahead and get going. Dan, take it away. Oh, okay. Um, hi, I'm Dan Perlman, and I'm speaking on behalf of the OLCEC, which stands for the Online Chapter Educational Committee. Uh, we have these what we call open forum workshops, and we have them every two months uh, on the odd months of the year, one, three, five, seven, nine, et cetera. Um, often we have, as we do tonight, uh, a financial expert who talks to us. Some of these are BI members who are not, not uh, necessarily their career, but who are very expert with financial knowledge. And uh, they do an introduction, followed by what makes this unique which is that we try to have more audience participation. So we hope tonight that you will have questions and, and comments. Um, so uh, those are the things that I want to say about the first slide. Can we have the second slide, please? Uh, Aren't you controlling it? Uh, I should introduce my fellow committee members. Shiram Mitabushi, Chris McCarran, who's the uh, chair of the committee, whose voice you've been hearing, and I'm Dan Perlman, and Phil Sudor, who's uh, from the uh, upstate New York, and uh, one of our very valued members. So those are the four of us who are the committee. Uh, next slide, which is the disclaimer. This information is, this presentation is for educational purposes only. And you shouldn't take anything that we say to be a recommendation to purchase or sell, nor if you see any logos of corporations or anything like that, they're not uh, recommendations to buy or sell. It is conceivable that uh, one or more of us might have stocks that are discussed tonight, but we have strict ethical guidelines uh, and we are not here to try to advocate to you that you buy or sell any particular stock. Instead, we're here to educate and we hope that you will do your own review and analysis of any company of interest that uh, we may discuss before making any investment decisions. Of course, um, and I'm speaking off the script, those of us who are here uh, on our committee generally like the BI philosophy of investing and hope that you might take into consideration the kinds of factors that better investing takes into consideration. Next slide, please. Um, some of you may want to have this recording, it is recorded, uh, this meeting captioned. And down at the bottom of your screen, you will see uh, a symbol CC. If you click on CC, you will get 
uh, a pop-up and it will ask you, uh, do you want subtitle uh, captions or do you want a full transcript, which would appear in a separate panel on your screen. And you could adjust the text side size if you, you wanted, but you, and you also can change the language if you want it translated. Um, I guess you can get it in a different language, but uh, primarily it's for uh, English. So um, next slide. I'm still, see, okay. Um, uh, so uh, just a little bit about the online chapter. It's a chapter that's for all Better Investing members who are not members of a geographically uh, located chapter. And so uh, it car captures people from the East Coast to the West Coast uh, and all around the globe. There are people in the EU, in Britain, uh, even in Asian countries. We have about 3,000 members in this chapter, so it's by far the largest better investing chapter. Uh, it's like other BI chapters in many ways. It, it, for example, it has model club, it has uh, regular chapter meetings, um, that kind of thing, an annual meeting. Um, but it is a little bit different in that it operates online. Uh, it, as I said, it has members outside the United States and um, it has what are called satellites. These satellites are um, two or three or maybe four members in an area who want to help other BI members in their region. So it's a way that we reach into specific regions, specific cities or specific parts of a state uh, to have local individuals who can be BI representatives. Um, and as I said, we have these workshops every month. Next slide, please. Um, so uh, during the presentation part of this webinar, we would ask that you turn off your mic. You can turn on your mic uh, if you want to ask a question afterwards, or you can put questions and comments in the chat. chat. Um, and we've talked about how to activate the uh, closed captioning. Uh, the slides and recording of this webinar will be ar archived on the OLC website in probably two to three days. So uh, you can go there. I think it's under uh, news, right, Chris, that the uh, uh, webinars are recorded. And there are some other very good webinars there. If you haven't attended any of our webinars, um, we've had very nice speakers in the past, and we do recommend um, those presentations. So now I'm going to turn things over to Chris, who will introduce the speaker we are very fortunate and very pleased to have for this evening. Thanks, Dan. Sorry, I'm having trouble getting my controls back. Uh, yes, Mike, Mike Allison, I actually met him. He was a guest on my podcast. And he was, we had such a great conversation. I enjoyed all of his wisdom and his interest, his, his much more, um, I guess, interactive or um, that's not the right word, but he has a way of, he's a little bit different than your traditional financial investor, financial advisor. And he calls himself a financial provocateur. So, <laughs> and he owns it. He started a company called New Lantern Advisors, which he can tell us a little bit more about later. Um, I, I took from his website a few nuggets about him, and one that we were particularly interested in was the green olive kryptonite. <laughs> so, maybe Mike, you can tell us a little bit about that afterwards. But our topic tonight that Mike is going to address is actually the difference between common and preferred shares. And I also wanted to mention, as Dan was saying, where the 
recordings are available. They're also available on our new YouTube channel. And as, as we mentioned earlier, we're live streaming this as well on Facebook. So we're really coming right into the 20th century here, maybe even the 21st century. We're on, on the cusp there. So Mike, do you wanna take over and sort of just chat with, talk to these slides, which are like this, I talk, just have slides about what's the same and what's different um, on, on common versus preferred. And then we'll talk about why you may or may not wanna have them in your portfolio. Um, sure. Can you hear me, uh, Chris? We can. Thank you. Okay, that that's great, and uh, uh, thank you for the chance to be with you this evening. And I apologize in advance for being a little disheveled. Uh, we drove 400 miles today to uh, get to um, uh, our destination for spending a little time down in Florida. So uh, uh, it's uh, <laughs> uh, I'm a little. Uh, and, and now in a, an unfamiliar setting, which we just arrived at about a half an hour ago. So I apologize for any technical difficulties and for not shaving today. <laughs> uh, You're already so, forgiven. We don't worry thank about you. that. <laughs> so, uh, so uh, thank you, Chris, for uh, for teeing that up. And and I too really really enjoyed our conversation. And it's it's amazing how much things have changed, even in the time that's passed since we had our conversation back in July. And, um, you know, I know you had a bit of a backlog, so our podcast um, episode didn't go live until in the fall. But um, as some of the things I, I mentioned, my after spending 30 plus years in the investment management business and 22 years at the same firm, which I retired from at the end of 2021, my idea in starting New Lantern Advisors uh, was to take some of the investment concepts that I um, that I uh, managed in and strategies that I managed uh, in funds at my prior corporate uh, world in my prior prior, prior corporate world, uh, and and do those strategies provide those solutions to individual clients and and my initial um, plan to do that was for you know uh, individual and advisory clients, and as time passed and I uh, started to do more and more of that I realized that. Um, uh, that the solution was going to still be a, a commingled vehicle. So there are um, private funds involved uh, and we've sort of pivoted the business in the last few months to just be focused on investment management, not, not so much com comprehensive uh, financial planning, which was the original uh, approach. So uh, to the extent that people may have seen uh, the podcast and the things we talked about a few months ago versus what you might see on my website today, that's the, that's the difference is really trying to um, provide the same solutions for the same clients, but in in the context of a, of a, of a fund or a co-mingled vehicle, which is really uh, important for the precision required to deploy the strategies that, uh, that I focus on, which is really uh, uh, risk-adjusted uh, retirement income alternatives to annuities and other, uh, other types of approaches for retirement income. So uh, having said that, with that backdrop, um, and I apologize in advance if there's uh, if if I'm a more basic than I should be in terms of com, uh, commenting on the the differences of common and preferred and and sort of the uh, the stack of securities in a balance sheet of a of a corporation. Um, so so the assets of a corporation are what they are, liabilities are what they are, and then the equities are what they are. A corporation will issue equity. Uh, Sorry. Go ahead. Um, yes, please. I just want to make sure that we're going to focus on common versus preferred. I, yes. I just, yes. Okay. Okay. Good. I, um, yep. And, so and the slides keep kind of flicking through. Are you comfortable talking to those slides, or do you want to just chat? At this point, I'm not seeing slides. I'm only seeing a grid. Of yeah, I'll put it names. on. I'll put it okay. if you um if. You So corporations, public, public corporations raise money or private to raise capital to fund their business in a variety of different means of issuance. And uh, starting from the highest level, uh, they would issue bonds and the bondholders uh, hold the strongest claim on the assets of the corporation um, in terms of getting paid back their invested capital. And the promise there is we will return your capital, we'll pay you a stated rate of interest uh, and, you know, subject to 
you know, the, the vagaries of the business uh, that the corporation runs. That's the kind of the highest level of, of stakeholder in, in the financial hierarchy of a balance sheet of a corporation. Uh, at the bottom end is the common stockholder uh, who participates in the growth of the corporation, uh, the opportunities of the corporation, but they have the least claim, the lowest claim on the assets of the corporation should uh, things go awry and that corporation goes bankrupt, for example. Um, in between the bondholders and the common stockholders um, is a type of a type of security referred to as preferred stock. And it is like a bond in that it pays a stated rate of interest. Um, it is junior to the claims of the bondholders, but senior to the claims of the stockholders. The common stockholders, if the corporation, for example, pays a dividend, uh, that dividend is not contractual. So the company, if things uh, go poorly with the operations of the company, they could cut their dividend or they could eliminate their dividend. There's no requirement contractual or otherwise for, for a company to pay a dividend on their common stock. Um, the preferred stock has more of a, of a contractual obligation to pay uh, coupons. So the way to, or, or uh, distributions income, the way to think about preferred stock is essentially like a perpetual bond. It has no maturity. Uh, the bonds who are most senior in the, in the, uh, 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 the seniority of the or, or the claims on the assets of the corporation. A bond, when you buy a bond, it has a stated um, it has a stated coupon, which tells you how much income that bond will earn you, and it has a maturity date. Uh, there can other other elements of bonds that can make them a little more complicated in terms of uh, different covenants and pro, uh, provisions. But essentially, there's a maturity date and there's a coupon rate, and that tells you what the yield is and when you're going to get your money back. Preferreds basically say we've got a contractual obligation to pay a, a, a coupon, a bond, or a, an income payment to you, but they're perpetual in that they have no maturity date. So they, in that context, behave more like common stocks. So, um, what does that mean, and, and why might you or might you not want preferred stock in your in your portfolio? A um, couple of things. Number one, historically. Preferred stock was much more um, uh, broadly used by, by corporations who were raising capital. In more recent times and in the current time, preferred stocks are generally issued by, and all the most of the outstanding issuance of preferred stocks are generally focused more on a narrow group of, of uh, industries or sectors, primarily the financial sector. So um, the income that they pay, the coupons that they pay, are generally higher than the common stock dividend uh, and less than the bonds. Um, but it is still a pretty um, high income element of, um, of the total return. Uh, and so, so we'll get to the place in the portfolio in a second. But the, the other part that is, is uh, important to mention is that um, liquidity is a very important element to the risk and return of any security. Um, large caps usually, uh, large cap stocks usually have lower returns on average than small cap stocks. Part of the reason for that is small cap stocks are less liquid. Um, preferred stocks along the same lines are less liquid than common stocks. And because they're concentrated in certain sectors like the financial sector and they're less liquid, they, are, they need to pay a higher dividend than a common stock to attract investors to them. Uh, and they theoretically should have a higher total return because of that less, uh, that lower liquidity than, than liquidity than common stocks. So when you think about risk and reward, and this is how we should always think about investing, what are you risking and what's your opportunity for return, common stocks tend to have higher opportunity for return because they're more liquid, um, but they're also more volatile. Uh, preferred stocks are less liquid, but they're less volatile, which is counterintuitive when you think about small cap versus large cap stocks. Uh, because there's a contractual obligation to the dividend payment, just like bonds. 
So it really does, they do, they really do sit in between common stocks and bonds in terms of their risk reward and income element. The um, other thing to think about is the, is the components of total return. Um, when you think about yield and you think about income, that's simply a portion of total return. The total return is what's the value of my, my investment at the end of the period as compared to the beginning of the period. So if I invest $100 in a stock and at the end of the period it's worth 110, then I've made 10%. It doesn't matter how I got that 10%. It could be that the value of the stock appreciated 8% and I got a 2% dividend along the way. Still the same 10% total return. Um, in a bond, I might've gotten 7% of income and 3% of total return because maybe the value of the bond went up over the course of the, the holding period. Preferred stock might be in between there. Maybe it's 5% and 5%, for example. The point is, is that the yield offered and the income offered by any particular security is not directly tied to the total return of that investment. And that's a very important distinction because especially when you think about the, the taxability of the portion of income coming from total return, um, it, it's, a, it's not relevant when you're talking about retirement accounts that aren't, uh, there's, no, there's no tax outcomes until you start taking distributions. But in taxable accounts, it's very relevant. Um, if my $100 investment in a common stock that doesn't pay a dividend goes up 10%, I've realized 10% of an increase in the value of my investment, but until I sell that stock, I don't have to pay any tax. Whereas in the case of a bond where maybe I'm, I'm getting 7% of coupon or interest income and the rest of that total return is 3%, 7% of my total return is taxed at ordinary income rates in a taxable account. So an after-tax return, comparing those two things, uh, is lower for bonds than it is for stocks in a taxable account. Uh, likewise, for preferreds, the more income you get, there are different types of preferred stocks. Some of them pay uh, dividends that are taxed as ordinary income, like bonds. And so that would pay uh, a higher, typically a higher marginal tax rate than um, for example, long-term capital gains rates, uh, qualified dividend income payments, uh, when you get a common stock dividend, um, are taxed at the same rate as long-term capital gains, which is lower than ordinary income. So after tax, it's better to get qualified dividend income or long-term capital gains than ordinary income on an after-tax total return basis. And so you have to be very uh, cognizant of if you're if you buy a preferred stock, what kind is it? What kind of dividend payment does it pay? Does it pay ordinary income or does it pay qualified dividend income? That's an important thing to look into. So um, the, the way to think about preferreds and where they might fit into your portfolio, number one, there's a sector concentration issue. Um, if you have a portfolio that is already heavily exposed to financials, financial stocks, uh, the financial sector, then you might want to think twice about adding to that sector exposure in the form of preferred stocks. But if you were less allocated to the financial sector and, and an equity portfolio, then you would have some room to add preferred stocks from that sector exposure because they typically are more uh, focused on the financial sector. And then the other part of it is how much of your total return is coming from income versus capital gains and what's the taxability of that income? So those are the ways to think about, I would say, common stocks versus preferred stocks and how they fit into a portfolio of, uh, you know, the, the classic 60, 40 equities versus bonds portfolio. So I can shut up there, Chris, and, uh, and would be very, very happy to answer any questions or respond or reflect on any of the things I've said before or expand on anything that maybe I wasn't clear on. Chris, are you still here? All right. I'm here, but it's a little noisy. Will you take over, Phil? Sure. Um, 
<clears throat> at this point, um, does anybody have any questions to uh, relating to either or both? You know, Mike, I, I think that everybody wants to to have growth over time. And when you see uh, the indices like the S&P 500 and so on, you get this sort of average growth over a period of, of time. And, and when you put in different classes of investments, how, how do uh, preferreds do um, in terms of, of long-term total return? Um, thanks, Dan. Um, I would say that um, the performance, all else equal, is somewhere between bonds and common stocks on average. But that is also um, tied to the sector more uh, than is highly highly correlated with the sector in which the issuer of the preferred stock um, lies. And so, for example, if it's a bank stock, um, the the bonds of a of a bank and the common stock of a bank are somewhat correlated. The preferred stocks of a bank would be more correlated. I would say, I would say probably more. And this is anecdotal and and just based on my historical observation, no no um, uh, empirical analysis, at least recently. Um, I would say historically. I believe that the preferred stock performance has been within a sector's performance. That's the, the biggest correlation or the highest correlation. Uh, preferred stocks tend to probably follow the performance of the common stocks more so than the bonds of that particular sector. Thank you. Um, I don't know in our audience how many people may have owned preferred stock, but um if nobody if if you if if we haven't owned a preferred stock to date um is there a good way to that you'd recommend getting started with either looking or evaluating a preferred stock versus the common stock um uh, sorry i was just reading a, another question that came through is is somewhat related to that um my own personal opinion is that for for retail investors um, and, and and those who are just simply maybe looking for more yield as a proportion of their total return in their portfolio, um, I would suggest that preferreds are not the best use of your capital, only because there's so much nuance that has to go into evaluating an individual security. Uh, and there are people who do that for a living. Uh, and, and the liquidity, which is so much a component of, of trading in and out of these securities, um, that your time is probably better spent figuring out, um, you know, what's my, what's my stock and bond allocation or what's, how much of my non-equity allocation should be uh, you know, cash, short-term treasuries, and uh, other components of fixed income. Because, you know, it's interesting in, in the in interest rate environment we have today, um, you know, cash is no longer trash. Cash has got to yield, or at least short-term, you know, short-term interest, uh, short-term uh, fixed income interest. It's like 90 and 60 day, or 90 and six month, 90 day and six month treasuries, for example. You've got a real yield, that as inflation is very rapidly coming down, you've got actually a positive yield, a positive real yield on, on short-term fixed income type instruments that essentially bear no credit risk. And so um, not, not that I'm giving any advice here, uh, but, but I, I think it's probably for, for folks who are doing this as an avocation or on their own or whatever. Um, my, my personal opinion would be that your time is better well spent um, 
trying to figure out how to get the right components of the yield as a portion of your overall portfolio's total return. Um, and and uh, not be uh, subject to the vagaries of a very, very illiquid and opaque market, which is what the preferred market is. So it doesn't sound like you're you're especially recommending the use of, of time to be uh, evaluating uh, preferred stock. But from a uh, comparison standpoint, could or would you um, would we be able to assume that generally the preferred stock, uh, if they were paid dividends, would be you know quarterly as well as as common stock? That's also going to be contractual. Some of them are quarterly. I believe a lot of them are also semi-annually like bonds, but that would be issue by issue. And yet another thing that you would have to spend time figuring out before you invest it. Because again, I would assume that the, the uh, preferred stock, what they pay, what the yield is, that's all much more difficult to find than a uh, common stock dividend. It's uh, it's definitely, uh, I mean, it's out there, it's public, but you have, to, you have to dig a little deeper and it's not as easily found. I would agree with that. And it's also a negotiated market, like a bond market. So uh, meaning um, stocks are listed on an exchange. There are market makers who uh, provide or liquidity providers in that market where in the bond market and the preferred market, um, you can only sell to a willing buyer. There's no exchange that is standing in between the sellers and buyers to facilitate an, um, a functioning market. So that's one of the great things that um, it's important to remember, great meaning important, that, that it's very important to remember in times of market strife, which is when it matters the most, um, you know, when the when the other side of the trade disappears and you want to sell that instrument, whatever it is, a bond or a, a preferred, um, if nobody's on the other side, you're just selling into a vacuum. And and that that goes back to my comment about retail investors and what happens to them versus people who do this for a living. Um, that is a time when um, when it's very easily uh, it's very easy for retail investors to get taken advantage of. From a pricing perspective so that's my very cynical uh long-term professional investing uh perspective on on these types of instruments um even so far as you could in, you could participate in fixed income via etfs which are actually traded like stocks where there's a market maker and it's a listed instrument and that's your best bet versus trading individual bonds unless you intend to hold that bond to maturity and so you don't have to trade it Um, just a, a couple of questions that I've seen come into the, the chat about um, why would anyone issue preferreds uh, and, you know, kind of what was the, what's the attractiveness and why is it concentrated in the uh, financial sector and why they used to be more popular. Um, I, I think that um, uh, financial, uh, financial companies, particularly banks and insurance companies, they are prolific issuers of, of capital of capital instruments, uh, debt in particular. And the way that generally the financial sector thinks of preferreds is a, is a form of debt, perpetual debt, but still uh, effectively debt. And depending on how those are trading in the open market, they are actually treated as debt by the regulators um, sometimes. And so, so they view that as a different form of diversification of their issuance of, of bonds into the marketplace to raise capital to run their business, both, both uh, banks as well as insurance companies. Um, other sectors out there in the world, um, uh, based on the historic uh, uh, operations of capital markets, um, you know, certainly in the last, since the great financial crisis when um, it's been a pretty easy money policy, uh, quite easy money policy. It wasn't hard to raise cap. It wasn't hard to raise capital, basically of any sort. So money was was uh, capital was very cheap. So there's no real reason for other sectors to 
um, to issue preferreds, which are a hybrid between bonds and stocks, when they could just sell stocks or issue uh, equity capital to raise capital to to uh, grow their business. Um, or uh, when you, you know, what's why would you need to issue preferred stock, which has got an equity component? We could just simply issue very very low interest rate bonds um, for you know very very attractive. Uh, uh, rates of rates of interest from you as an issuer perspective, very low cost debt. Those uh, that environment's changed over the last 12 months. And so it, it bears to watch. Maybe you might see some more um, preferred stock issuance. Maybe you might see more convertible stocks, uh, which is a whole nother area of analysis and, and uh, not one that I'm particularly versed in. But um, uh, I hope I hope that it, that addressed a couple of the the questions in the in the chat. Excellent. So we now uh, does anyone have any other questions that specifically about common or preferred shares? Doc. And does everyone feel that their questions have been addressed as far as this part of the of the conversation is concerned? Um, Mike, I'll ask another question, and that is, you know, I'm getting a come somewhat of a conservative perspective toward uh, preferreds, but are there any conditions where you would buy cons preferred? Are there there are buyers or uh, properties of the the uh, preferred or times in the economic cycle, things like that, that would uh, make buying a, a preferred uh, a little more attractive. I, I guess I'm asking this because some of the financial advising news that I read um, in, in the last couple of years when interest rates were very low, I got the feeling that people were putting some money in preferred as a ways to, uh, you know, Get a fairly secure, better interest rate. Um, yeah, we we call that reaching for yield, um, which is basically moving out on the risk spectrum uh -huh. uh, to to get um, yield. And remember, as I mentioned before, yield or the income component of total return is just that—a portion of the total return. Um, not to be uh, overly cynical, and it's not um, directly applicable, but it's important to. Uh, to realize the uh, the analog, if you think about if you follow anything at all with the uh, sort of the crypto cryptocurrency blowups and all of those sorts of things, when you when you heard stories about cryptocurrencies yielding twenty percent, well, when there's a yield, meaning you're getting an income rate of twenty percent on your investment, for that investment to not degrade in value over the course of time, the total return has to be greater, at least 20%, if not greater. And so the, the income you're getting is a function of some portion of total return. And if the income is greater than the total return from that instrument, the value of your investment goes down. Mm -hmm. And so I would say what would make preferreds interesting to me would be the same thing that would make certain areas of fixed income interesting to me, which would be a market dislocation where, I mean, this is like opportunistic, you know, digging in the dumpster kind of value opportunities where the market's not functioning well and you're going to adopt a Warren Buffett approach to investing, which is be fearful when people are greedy and be greedy when people are fearful. When a market is dysfunctional, uh, and you can you can uh, uh, look at look at potential investment opportunities where it looks the most bleak. Um, that's where that's where opportunities lie. But you have to you have to uh, realize the risk you're taking by leaning into that. Uh, but that's where often some of the greatest returns can come too. But you have to do your work, and you have to understand what you're getting yourself into. And you have to be willing to uh, to lose what you put in because you could be wrong, and the market could be right. 
So if you're going to bet against the market, which is what we're talking about here, you have to be willing to be wrong. And, um, and so for preferreds for me, um, that would be, uh, that would be what would, might make them, might make them interesting. Um, you know, if it looked like all, all the wheels were coming off the financial system again, um, you know, maybe you could, you, maybe you could participate in some of the issues out there where you've got a contractual dividend payment, you're bidding against bankruptcy, and um, you've got, you know, tremendous investment opportunity. Having said that, in that environment, the biggest investment opportunity is going to be the common stock because it's going to be down the most. So that's the conundrum when you're talking about um, risk and reward. When you were talking, I was thinking about why wouldn't you buy common stock in that? Right, right. Sounds like, you know, one of the things um, to go back to the BI philosophy, um, the BI philosophy is buy stocks when they're, you know, when, when um, uh, they're, they're at a low price in their uh, cycle of prices. And, um, so uh, bad times yeah, I mean, are often good times uh, for, for, for purchasing. If you, can, if you can figure out when the bottom comes, I guess. Um, I haven't well, quite figured that one out. <laughs> well, uh, I, I always say that only one guy gets the bottom tick, right? So you don't have to get in the bottom. But um, but you you do have to you do have to decide that um, the market's wrong and the market's not necessarily wrong just just because the stock's down. Mm -hmm. You know, the stock can be down for the right reasons, mm -hmm. and you know, and stay down for a long time. So you know, there are all kinds of elements that go into the valuation of a security. Uh, it's the cash flows from that security, either current or future, expected. And there's the confidence of, of actually getting those cash flows. And that's really what, that's really what, and the interest rate that you would discount future cash flows at, which is what the markets struggled with in the last year or so. Mm -hmm. So those are the components that go into devaluing a security. And any of those, you could get wrong. So philosophically, I very much agree with the BI philosophy that, uh, you know, buying a mispriced security uh, because the market is more fearful than it should be about um, about the valuation of a particular investment. Um, but you you also have to dig in and get some dirt under your fingernails to realize and, and make a decision that, yep, uh, I could be wrong on this, but the weight of evidence shows that if I lean into this my and, and have patience, then it could turn out to be a really great opportunity. Mm -hmm. There's another follow-up question. Uh, do you know if preferred stocks or convertibles are more popular in other countries? Um, well, um, I would say that in other developed countries, I would say probably in emerging countries, no. Um, you know, they have a hard enough time raising capital of any sort. Um, in in developed countries, for example, Japan or or um, or Europe, um, most of the companies in those uh, countries and those regions are much more comfortable uh, issuing debt and much more comfortable and expected to pay dividends on their common stocks than in the U.S. And so, I would say that, and I've tried to not be overly cynical in, in this discussion, but, but I would say preferred stocks and convertibles and all sorts of like creative instruments are more creations of Wall Street to help their investment banking clients uh, and to raise capital than, than the investors that they're sold to. You know, um, it's, the more straightforward it is, the better it is typically for the investor. The more smoke mirrors and opacity there is, the more opaque it is. Um, typically, that's when the investor um, is at a disadvantage. The retail investor, particularly.
Excellent. Thanks, Mike. Does anyone have any other questions for Mike? Or I, I should say, does anyone have any questions for Mike about common or preferred stock? Because I'll ask him to just hang around for a few more minutes while we take the floor to any questions that have anything to do with stock investing. And you can be uh, bold and just take yourself off mute and speak out your question or else you can be shy and put it in the chat. It's completely up to you. We're now uh, in the open form portion and you can ask any question that you like. Can I ask the question? I mean... Absolutely. Uh, hi, my name is Yuval. I am from uh, Houston Model Club. And the, the question I have is, when I go to the SSG and trying to analyze companies, so you go by the PEs and see the average, average high, average low. So the question I have, for example, the other day I tried to analyze Comcast. And the problem with them is that the, the problem, I mean, I didn't figure out the, the way how to analyze it because the PE was, uh, was like the, the TTMPP the, was way higher than the average, low and average high. So what, what do you do in this uh, case, for example? Um, one of the things, and this is the challenge of, of just sort of screening on publicly available data sources, is that um, a lot of times corporate actions um, and the rules of accounting, uh, GAAP or generally accounting, uh, generally accepted accounting, accounting principles, um, force companies to report earnings in a certain way that don't necessarily represent the uh, the economic value of what's going on in the in the company. Um, For example, they might make an acquisition that distorts earnings and and makes the earnings appear on a on a GAAP basis, meaning a, according to accounting principles, uh, vastly understates earnings. And um, and makes the earnings appear un inappropriately low versus if you make adjustments for all that, and there are people who do this for a living as I did for many years, um, you have to adjust the earnings for the accounting things that are really just rules based. And frankly, our accounting system is is geared more to uh, an, a backward looking industrial type of an economy versus a, a forward looking uh, digital and, and more human based economy, hmm. uh, which is what we have today. And so the companies on a reported basis have to follow the old rules by law, um, but the market makes adjustments for those rules that aren't particularly relevant anymore to the economic value of the company. I'll give, you an, I'll give you another example. You mentioned Comcast, but if you think about a lot of the big tech stocks um, that uh, you can make a, a very strong argument for them that the, the investment in their people versus a factory in the old industrial economy, you know, a, a physical investment in a facility, for example, that made widgets you would amortize over some period of time, so call it 50 years. So you would only uh, count 2% of that investment each year over 50 years against your earnings. Whereas if you hire a bunch of software engineers, you and, and they're there for some period of time creating value, like a factory, then, but according to the accounting rules, you have to expense their salaries every year. So you can make a very strong argument that some of the mega tech stocks or tech stocks in general, by the rules of the accounting, uh, the accounting rules, understate their earnings. And so when people make an argument that like, oh, so-and-so is overvalued because it's at an X PE, mm -hmm. um, if you adjust for some version of that expense being something that in a, in a prior world, you would amortize over time, they're actually not overvalued so much, if at all. And so it's, it's understanding the nuances of creating economic value, which is the company's job, 
and then how that gets reflected in the stock price as a as a function of the accounting rules which are you know mandated by law for mm -hmm. you know for audited financial statements for example so that's why it's very difficult for you to generalize and and draw um draw uh broad distinctions on on public uh data sources to, to say this stock is overvalued or undervalued so hopefully that wasn't a, an overly long discussion but it was a very good question but i it, i hope that we can convey like not everything is apples to apples and every company's got their own thing going on and that's also in the in the context of a, a sector or an industry that generally reports earnings in the same way mm -hmm. it's like uh, this uh, Has anyone on the call done a, an SSG on Comcast lately that can shed any light for you, Val? About Comcast? Yeah, I was just asking if anybody else on the call had done a, a, anything with Comcast any lately. Light, yeah. <laughs> I guess we haven't had anybody else do an, an SSG on Comcast lately, but that's... Um, I think you've all there's other folks in the Houston club that maybe um, also can help you work through when these weird things happen, like like Mike was saying with with the way they have to report things from an accounting perspective. I think I think it's only in Comcast. I, I mean, I check the other telecommunications like AT and T and Verizon. I don't think it's it's the same. But yeah, but a Comcast maybe, isn't, I don't think that's always the case with Comcast, right? There's something that's going on with them right now that's making it weird. And that, that could very much be a function of, of prior corporate actions, acquisitions, what have you. That's going to be very company specific. Yeah, the, the write off like uh, Sky News, I think. So that, that was the uh, made, made like a big uh, change in the. Yep. Um, that's the that's the sort of thing that could uh, distort reported earnings versus um you know versus the sort of the economic earnings if you would mm. great question you all and thanks for the for the answer mike um i put it in the chat but mike do you want to just let people know how they can reach you um if they wanted uh, to ask any more questions that when you have sure time. <laughs> happy to happy to chat i mean part, part of what i do is and i and chris I, I really appreciate the chance to chat with this group um part of what i do what i enjoy doing and and um like to do is is uh just you know try to educate people as best i can um you know i i've been doing this a long time and and one of the things i really do enjoy is try to try to cut through the jargon, cut through um, with really kind of real world explanations for what sometimes is not obvious or sometimes is, um, you know, put forth by the industry as, as gospel. And, you know, sometimes you have to dig through that to, um, to really get to the essence of what something really means. And so if you, if you, in a lot of what you see on my website that I write about and, and other articles that get published on my website, there's a lot of the sort of educational things on there, which, you know, hopefully if you find those of value that you're welcome to peruse there. But yeah, just newlanternadvisors.com. And, you know, my email is just mike at newlanternadvisors.com. Happy to chat if you have any, you know, follow-up questions or any, you know, kind of deeper dive questions. I'll help if I can, you know, I, um, not not in a financial advice perspective, but if from a financial education perspective, I, I want to help where I can. Cool. Thank you. <clears throat> and I invite everybody to join us. You know, we have these open forum workshops the third Wednesday of every odd month. We're an odd group, so we chose the odd month. I love that. <laughs> um, at the eight there they happen at 8.30 p.m. Eastern time. We always start with a presentation, like our great presentation from Mike today. And then we open it up to your questions on any stock investment-related topic. All present, presented by your friendly neighborhood 
online chapter education committee. Um, it's the same link that you use to register for tonight that you can register for the whole series. And we're now live streaming on the Facebook page. We now also have a YouTube channel, which is in the chat. And you're invited to this recording will be there. And if nobody, we have like two minutes left. If anybody has another quick question, otherwise I'll go ahead and close out the meeting for today and thank everybody really very much for being with us. Can I say something? Hello, can you hear me? Of course, absolutely. I'm new to the group. Um, I Hi, was Karen. part of this when it was NAIC. Remember the name was NAIC years and years ago. Um, and we had an investment club. Um, I put money in there, it grew my kids. It was the money that I invested in NAIC that we were able to use to actually pay for college for my kids. And after that was done, um, I changed jobs and then got busy and fell off following. So I rejoined, so I'm fairly new. So I feel like a fish out of water and I'm hoping to get more knowledge to go back and learn the SSG. I remember we used to do that as well. So that's my first time here and I'm looking forward to, <laughs> to learning well, more. Karen, I, I think you'll find that there are some other long-term uh, NAIC people here. <laughs> and um, if you did them by hand, You'll yeah, like we did. <laughs> where you'll like that it is uh, now um, all computerized, but I I think that the principles are, you know, quite quite similar. I think there's more discussion and and so on today, uh, but mm -hmm. uh, uh, the basic fundamental philosophy is is still very much the same, and it's like riding a bicycle. I think if you had success before, I hope you have success again, and. Uh, I think that you will find that that uh, you know it is it, it will come back to you uh, the way the way you were doing things, and hopefully, if you want to join a club, um, hopefully you'll be able to find one in your area. Yes, where, I'll be looking for one in my area. Um, one, another well. thing, now you're you're online with us. Um, some people find that being online is pretty satisfactory. There are a few little quirks about tax reporting. If you have members in multiple uh, jurisdictions, mm -hmm. but uh, certainly there are virtual clubs now. So uh, mm. you, you could find one. One way to sort of start is to look for some model clubs. Um, the online chapter has a list of model clubs and you could you know, try out a model club or two and mm -hmm. possibly, you know, there's ways to join clubs if you if you uh, are at a model if you go to a model club. Some model clubs will take new new people. Where whereabouts are you located? What's that? With whereabouts do you live? Oh, I live in New York. I'm in Manhattan. Oh. Oh. <laughs> well, uh, I'm, I, there were people on from from New York, uh, and uh, New York is in the OLC, actually. Uh, so so uh, I, I don't think there is a model club in New York, um, New York City, anything. Um, but Abby looking, might be a good resource, right? Abby's in New York. Yeah, I'm looking forward to educating myself to learn, again, how to do the <laughs> SSG on my own. Um, with the market going down, I've lost so much. And... I said, oh my God, if I was still doing NAIC, I'm sure I would have been smart enough. And some of the decision I made that was so stupid. <laughs> so, you know, coming can't look back. back though, Karen. You're back. You're back yeah. with the, in the fold now. So you'll be you'll be back to life. Um, before we drop off, I just want to remind everybody, I was doing a wonderful presentation on January 30th at 8:30 p.m. Eastern time called Stock Investing Made Easy preferred procedure simplified and Karen that might be a great one for you to Sounds attend good. and and it'll give you an introduction to Avi if you don't already know him he's a fantastic resource okay. well, All right. thanks so here. much everybody for being with us thank you All right. I'm gonna thank you and join us
join us next time. Yes. Um, now I have to figure out how to stop sharing on Facebook, which will be interesting. <laughs> good night and goodbye, everyone. Bye. Good night. Bye, everyone.